Alright guys, uh, welcome to Doozer Shop. Haven't had an update for you in a while. We're making progress on the uh, Colchester 17 inch lathe as usual. Um, let me take you around and show you what I got. Alright, there she is. I'll put back together. So that I, that's a, um, I believe a Brooks Compton motor, British, British made. And uh, let me kind of show you a little bit uh, closer what I had uh, done to it. Um, let me show you back up here. Uh, I had both the bells off, right? So last time you've seen everything was apart, I painted the bells black, the end bells. And as you remember, um, these three screws are for the retainer plate for the thrust side bearing. So that bearing's locked in solid and uh, the other side floats. It has two um, little uh, wave washers. Alright, this side uh, is the shaft end. And I got it all back together and, and I got the I got a, a lamp in my other hand. I want to break, break down here and show you, I might have to Jiminy Crickets here, kneel down on the floor. That's all right. What I do for my so Brema Brooks made by Brooks Motors Limited England. So that's so that's pretty cool. Uh, this is two, 230 volt only. See the four, four, the horsepower says eight, and then under that it says four because it's a two speed motor. And say 1800 RPM and 900 RPM. So let me talk about that. So 1700 and 860. So the synchronous speed of this motor is 1800 and 900. That's the synchronous speed. These motors always run in slip because that's how AC induction motors uh, operate. So most engineering speak we, we just say the synchronous speed even though 1725 or 1750 I, I know that's how they put it on there because they want to be heaven forbid we should be truth in advertising. But I, I always, typically motor people, electrical people talk about the motor's, uh, you know, synchronous RPM. And there's your current draw. All right, so the, as they call the, uh, the motor box, in the industry they call them a pecker head. I'm not sure why. But you got the, the leads coming down and there's six leads and uh, all the star or delta connections, whatever it happens to be, is inside the coil. So this is a single voltage motor. Essentially with six leads, it's two motors wound in one case. So uh, three, three leads are low speed, three leads are high speed. Now, all right. So what I've done is I've put shrink tube on each of the leads. You can see as they go up into the motor case. There's, uh, I used six inch uh, pieces of shrink tube that go all the way up right to the windings. And then I cut some three inch pieces that are just doubled over. I put double uh, protection around the hole in the case. Now you'll see there's an aluminum piece around uh, the opening with the hole in it. That aluminum piece is quarter inch thick aluminum plate that I made, I milled that out to reinforce the sheet metal uh, conduit box, pecker head box. And the reason was this box was distorted. I mean, I don't think it was hit by a forklift, but it was just Something beat on it, tugged on it, pulled on it, and you notice there's only two bolts that hold the conduit box to the 
you know, the, the motor frame itself. A lot of them have four, but this has two. So I made it like a glorified washer to spread the load out. Um, I used my hydraulic press and I pressed this conduit box back into shape. And there's a rubber, piece of rubber gasket, uh, rubber underneath it to keep the wires from chafing on the edge. You might see that in there. And I also put shrink tube around the ends of the terminals. Uh, so, so that was a good bit of work. So now I know the wires are re-sleeved with shrink tube. And that's the good shrink tube with the hot glue inside. That's really good shrink tube. All the way back to where the windings, I'm sorry, where the leads enter the windings. So that's all um, good, safe, it'll pass the, the mega ohm test, whatever. Okay, so there's that. So that's cool. Um, and uh, let me turn my light off. So that, that was a lot of work. So essentially, let me get up off the ground here. All right. So what I did to that motor, getting that pulley off was the big one because that was a two hour with the cutting torch heating it up. Cleaned the, the, cleaned the end bells. So much dirt, grease inside the end bells. So I cleaned both end bells. Um, I stripped the layer of gray paint right down to the primer. I used the needle scaler gun and then I cleaned them meticulously down to the original primer, painted them, cleaned them, painted them black. Now I've seen other motors, I think, I don't know who, Sears Craftsman motors were, were black ends and gray in the middle. I thought it looked kind of cool, but that's just rattle can uh, black paint. I'm assuming it's some kind of fast drying lacquer. They were the, the dollar fifty paint cans at either Lowe's or Home Depot, and it was it was black and it was it was a little bit thin. I don't know what they call it, you know, weekender spray paint. But anyways, I wanted them fast drying, but actually I, I painted these last week, and uh, they were plenty dry, and. Uh, I, I thought of getting the paintbrush and the rust oleum gray, machine gray, and painting them, but I, I, I do like the contrast. It looks really good. That's a big motor. I mean, if, if you know those five gallon water jugs, it is, it is bigger than that. So anyways, oh, so then, so painted both of those, cleaned them, all the grease off them, cleaned the paint off them, painted them. Clean the grease channels, the grease fitting down in there. Clean all the grease and gook out of there. It was ridiculous. And then I, you know, I new new grease grease uh, zerks in there. Clean the channel so there's it's, it's spectacularly clean. Um, and then the rotor, you know, the bearings were, you know, the one I cooked out on this side, on the shaft side, the one that got cooked from taking the pulley off. The grease turned into like tar. I mean, it melted and then re-solidified into absolutely something the consistency of tar. So I had to use the torch, the propane torch, and just warm up the grease to liquefy and let it drip out. And then while the bearing was hot from being liquefied, I put it in you know lacquer thinner. And while the, the grease was hot, lacquer thinner stripped it in the bearings. So. Oh, okay, so that's all clean, clean both bearings. So this rotor and bearings were immaculately clean. The bearings were in good shape. There was something like 100 millimeter or four inch outside diameter, and I think the inside diameter was 35 millimeter or like inch and three eighths ish. And I think they were an inch wide. So big, husky, open bearings, if you remember. Uh, so that's clean and that's done. So. If you remember, the mouse had chewed on the windings, um, the string on the windings, and that was on, on this side. And I bought some Glyptol-like stuff. Um, and I'm going to show you that. But I, I just, now I see this here. Here's the roll of uh, shrink tube. 
I don't know. It came from, but this stuff, you know, it has, uh, I mean, you're not gonna be able to see it, trust me. It has hot glue on the inside. And this is like a 100 foot roll, really good stuff. Highly recommend, you know, buy a 100 foot of something and then you'll have it. I mean, shrink tube is just fabulous. You can buy the little packs it, used to be Radio Shack, now Harbor Freight has it. Shrink tube, awesome. I've got like five sizes up to like inch, inch and a quarter down to spaghetti size. So that's awesome. All right. Um, Still no, you know, I still need to grind the gap on the Rockford planer. So let's, let's kind of head over there. Um, Alright, this stuff. Spray on, I don't know if 601 is the part number. You see here. I know the fluorescent lights are spray on red. Red insulating varnish. R Rouge red. This stuff. Um that's gl like Gliptol. That can was eight dollars at McMaster Car. Okay. Now spray on, spray on. I believe is a division of Sherwin Williams Paint. You can see my highly fashionable McMaster Car bags all over the shop. I placed an order to McMaster Car to get that for eight dollars. That was. I mean, I had to pay shipping, of course. But Gliptol. For a can of Gliptol was like $65 at Eastwood. And Eastwood is the automotive restoration place. Th that's a lot of money. Uh, it was like $45 and then shipping. It was like 60, 60 some dollars, 62. So this was $8 plus probably another $5 shipping. But when I go to McMaster Car, I always get more stuff. Um, so this is a 3 8 uh, ball valve with a nice handle. I don't like the lever handles sometimes, they're kind of in the way. But I bought that valve, made in Italy. I think that was only like $9. But see, the cool thing is, see this hex nipple, Schedule 80 hex nipple. It's got national pipe thread on this side. NPT, 3 8 NPT. On this side, is 3 8 um, I think 19 threads per inch, British tapered pipe thread. So the drain, uh, the drain hole, the drain on the Colchester headstock is 3 8 British pipe thread. Okay? So that's going to be my drain for the headstock. And it was right above the motor, I'll show you later. But this nipple, this hex nipple, converts 3 8 British pipe thread to 3 8 American pipe thread. So McMaster car, this was kind of expensive. That nipple was probably like $13, but well worth it. Now, um, I know BSP. So this brass hex thing is something they were throwing out. At, uh, on, it was in the scrap bin at work. but. This. So that's British pipe, male and female. Okay, so that just happens to be something I, I picked up. So this is the same thing, okay? Before I found the hex nipple in the McMaster car catalog, I found this. This was like five dollars. It's a Schedule 40 conversion nipple. Again, 3 8 National Pipe Thread American to 3 8 British Tapered Pipe Thread. And then I'm like, you know, I'd rather have a hex nipple. These are great, but I like the Schedule 80 because it's stronger. If you, if you whack on it by accident, it's not going to break. 
It's got the hex. I hate having wrench marks on it, so I just thought I'd show you that. Just as a little whatever. Okay, now uh, the Rockford. All right, let me kind of show you. Let me kind of set you up. All right. So. Alright, what we got here, I cleaned the entire, let me take this lamp off of here, I don't know if this is obstructing your view. Alright, the Rockford Hydraulic Open Side Planer. All this, um, in the last week, I cleaned it. So this, where you see gray, was all black gook. It was just nasty. So uh, what I did is I uh, used, I put blue shop towels, paper towels, down in the bottom here, okay? And I took lacquer thinner on a brush and I used lacquer thinner and I cleaned the back down and the, and the rags kind of absorbed everything. And I cleaned, so somebody uh, thoughtfully put grease to preserve the lead screw and the feed rod. Um, but, I mean, that was great, because this thing was in storage for like 25 years in my, uh, my buddy Jim's garage, his shop. So, I would fold the rags up and use full strength lacquer thinner on a brush, and I'd brush the back wall, I'd brush, you know, the lead screw. And uh, I cleaned the, the face, the top, because it's, so square way on top, so you got the face, so there's a, a gib strip, tapered gib on the top, there's a tapered gib around the back, and um, it's a dovetail on, on the bottom, right here. So, I'm moving this, I am so, I, I, I've put, uh, transmission fluid, ATF, on all the surfaces before I do the way oil, because ATF is thinner, and uh, I'm running it back and forth to, uh, you know, I keep re-upping the, uh, in the oilers with ATF and uh, keep running it back and forth, and uh, this thing glides back and forth. I mean, this thing is just... Uh, Beautiful. I have. I'm using very little effort cranking the uh, the screw here. There's no tight spots, you know, with uh, any machine. Not so much a lathe or a surface grinder because the the carriage is just setting on the waves. But anytime you got a set of you know dovetail waves or even you know, box ways for that matter if you keep them shimmed up tight and adjust it tight. If you get wear in the middle um, where the travel is used the most, or in the lathe up near the, the chuck, I guess. But uh, I'm sp specifically talking milling machines with dovetail ways. When you get wear, I mean, it'll be what it'll be. And then when you tighten the gibs, it's going to bind on the ends of the travel and not in the, in the middle. So the fact that I can run this planer head sideways fore and aft and you know the gib has to be adjusted you know properly. You want like a thousandth of running clearance on a gib. One thou. And you know this I am so pleased with my efforts here making this thing clean. Alright, so, so that's that's pretty good. Alright, so let me kind of show you a close-up of what I've been working on. So there's the planer head. And you can see how clean everything is. 
Um, and even in the back. So this I cleaned before. There's the counterbalance cable. And you can see all the scraping. <laughs> the, the light rust that was on there and since been removed highlights the scraping marks. But that's, uh, I cleaned that before. I did the same thing. You can see that gray primer color in that feed screw was all just covered in grease and there's the feed mechanism of course so I've been working on that quite a bit um, I think I showed you uh, the waves are a little splotchy from dripping lacquer thinner on it um, everything's pretty much clean and ready to go I gotta take off the felt wiper and clean it there you might not be able to see clean that one and clean the table. But aside from that, man, uh, I gotta change the oil yet. And I gotta put a cord on. There's the electrical box. I gotta put a cord on it. So I can either plug it in there or there. Um, so that's good. Um, <clears throat> in the inspection corner. That's about. Uh, it for uh, the planer. Let me uh, let me kind of uh, see what else is next, and uh, we'll uh, we'll show you what we get into. All right, guys, we've been talking about the motor quite a bit, but I wanted to show you the other uh, part I'm working on. So this is the input shaft to the headstock where the other pulley goes and that's the pulley on the floor that goes on this shaft and it's got a, a interior uh, drum brake um, and what, what the deal is is the shaft has a seal an oil seal like right there you can kind of see but uh, that shaft seal was leaking and the oil got all over the brake shoes and uh, so that's why I, I took I, the, basically the backing plate off for the uh, the brake shoes, and I was going to use uh, uh, just drive out the seal from the backside. And I figured, you know, there's like there's some bolts around the perimeter. I'll just take it off. But um, wh what the whole uh, backing plate is actually is the bearing, and you can kind of see. Um, it's not a ball bearing, it's a bushing. And I'll take you over to the bench in a little bit and I'll show you. It's two bronze bushings and that's the input shaft. And at first I thought it was sort of a cheap way out, but it's engineered really well. Interesting note, side note, there's two wood rough key keys that go in there. Um, there you go. And what the deal is is this. This is two woodruff keys. They go side by side. This one was down in between the brake shoes. It's almost like it's been there forever. It's all greasy and nasty. Somebody must have dropped that in behind one of the brake shoes. But anyways, that's the key arrangement. It's two woodruff keys with the corners knocked off for clearance. So, kind of neat. Never seen that before. Um, my stuff on the, the workbench there. But yeah, that's kind of cool. And let me show you around the headstock side. I got the lamp in there. I don't know if I showed you guys in the headstock in a while. So that's where it goes. That's the input shaft, and the spline, and the gears, and all the works. So that's the primary input, and then and, and it's supported on the other side, of course, with a, a bronze bushing as well. And that would be 
in there. So there's the primary shaft, there's the secondary shaft where the bolt is, and of course the main spindle. And the shifter levers are on top where that light, where the lamp is clipped on there. But let me show you the piece I pulled out. Well, first off, I was cooking the, uh, the brake shoes. They're about six inch diameter, maybe? I don't know. Um, so here's the piece. And here's the, uh, the brake activating lever. Here's the two flats, the cam, just like motorcycle brakes, and the stationary pin. And there's the seal that I, I need to uh, pop out. It'll be easy. Because this thing is rock hard and the rubber is just solidified you know, um, over the, the ages. So this is cool. This is two bronze bushings. And, uh, and how this works, let me show you. Um, the linkage. There's an O-ring seal on it, which is kind of cool. All right, so that slot, it looks like a, a key seat, but that's an oil slot. That, that faces up 12 o'clock inside the gearbox of the lathe. And oil catches, um, collects in there, and goes down the hole, okay? And what the deal is, if you can see, there is a space in there. And there's no drain. You can see the two bronze bushings. These are oilite centered bronze, okay? Um, so it's, they really hold the oil and dis distribute the oil on the shaft. So because there's two bushings in there, there's a reservoir for the oil. So this thing, when the uh, when the gears splash the oil up into that key seat, it's a trough, looks like a key seat, this whole inner um, area between the bushings, the annular annulus uh, area in there, gets filled with oil. Um, so there's no danger of, upon startup, um, pick the lamp on, dropping stuff. Um, there's no danger upon startup of that being the, the bushings being starved for oil. And actually, I was going to put an external pre luber pump on the lathe to carry oil up to the top, but uh, it doesn't need it because, like I said, there's a pocket uh, of oil between those two bushings. So even if the lathe is not running, it, it constantly has an oil reservoir uh, on the input shaft, which is, you know, high speed uh, input shaft, um, like 900,000 RPM. Okay, speaking of RPMs, check this out. So, that's the old pulley on the left there that I took off the lathe, and I didn't film it, but there's two hours of heating that up with a cutting torch just to try and get that off the shaft with the fretting rust. You can always tell that fretting rust, it's that red, red, brick red rust. Okay, huge pain in the butt to get off with a gear puller and a cutting torch heating that thing up for like, it was no joke, it was more than two hours. Um, but anyways, so I didn't have to. I could have put this back on. I didn't melt the shivs of the pulley. The pulley's still fine. But I purchased this pulley, okay? Because, two reasons. It's a taper lock, okay? So if you're not familiar with taper lock, and I'm probably not going to be able to do this one-handed. All right, it just took about a second. I had to use two hands. So this is how taper locks work. So there's three through holes which attach it, and then the, the three threaded holes are for uh, jacking it out. So it's split. So at 6 o'clock is the key, uh, keyway, and at 12 o'clock is the slit, and the slit goes all the way through. So it collapses because you can kind of see it's tapered. 
Okay, so it's got a tape around it, so when the bolts draw it in, it collapses because the slit is there. In the pulley, uh, the shivs are tapered. Um, the pulley's tapered as well. So that's cool. Alright, now, this is a 55V550 SD. SD is just a series of the bushing. 55 means it's five and a half inches outside diameter. And the V is for V belt. Okay, now, I had previously ordered uh, 55. Uh, a. And that was the wrong, that was not the right pulley. So there's V belts, there's A and B belts, and uh, I think A are 3 eighths, B are, uh, B are half inch? No, B are 5 eighths. I, I forget. But the deal is, the, the previous pulley I ordered, because it was an AB, and uh, like I said, B I believe is 5 eighths. When you get into the multiple, multiple shivs, five shivs, because it's made for a combination A, which sits down further in the groove, and B, which sits at the top of the groove, it's a combination so they can stock less on the shelf. Consequently, the spacing between everything is more, okay? So, this is three and a half inches wide. Let me kind of get that thing out there. All right, so now you may be saying, well, how much wider? Let me kind of line this up. Let me get this spray can dealios there. All right. All right. So the old one is three and a half inches wide. The new one is like three and three quarters. The one I sent back was four inches wide. So if you line up the center shivs, you're and you look at the edge, I mean, you're only off a smidgen, like maybe an eighth of an inch that side and an eighth of an inch that side. So that's pretty good. So like I said, this is for V-series belts, which are wedging belts. This was made for L-series belts, okay? which are straight up half inch wide belts. This one is made for V belts, which I believe the V is half inch also. No, the V is for 5 eighths, and the 5 eighths are supposed to ride up out of the, the, the V groove a little bit, out of the shiv a little bit. But the actual top of the shiv measures half inch, okay? So this is a V-belt for a 5V, okay? It's made for a 5V-belt. That's what this pulley is. It's made for a 5V-belt, which is a 5 eighths wide belt. 5 eighths wide V-belt. But because the V-series is a wedging series, that's what they call it, I don't know what the detail is, but it's supposed to wedge in there uh, and not ride on the bottom of the shiv. The 5 8 belt sits above the top of the surface. So if you load this up with 5 8 V belts, they are not going to be flush with the surface. They're going to be riding high. But the actual measurement is half inch. So 5 8 top width belt and because it's a V-series belt and a V-series pulley, the actual measurement across the top of this is half inch. So you go, this old pulley was made for the, the L-series belts. So the L4 is a half inch belt. So 
they don't make taper lock or anything in just the straight up L series. And all this doesn't really matter because it's kind of interchangeable until you get to the multiple shivs. So the best I could figure, the old pulley was for 4L belts, which are half inch. The new pulley is for 5, which is 5 eighths, V belts. And the actual width of the shiv is half inch because the 5 eighths is made to ride high. The actual V in the shiv is half inch at the top. So half inch actual dimension at the top, half inch actual dimension at the top of that one. So 4L pulley, 5V pulley matches up nearly perfect. And I'm going to run the 4L belts. Now, you also might notice, let me go, they're a little different diameter. Okay, I did that on purpose. Um, that one's four and a quarter outside diameter. And this is like five and a half. Okay, when you do the math, it turns my top RPM of that lathe, which is 900 RPM, it jacks it up to 1100. So I'm going from 900 RPM to 1100 RPM. Okay? That's why I got the bigger pulley because, you know, with carbide and, and everything, uh, I want to run a little bit faster. And I'm not breaking the bank, I'm not frying, frying an egg on the world here trying to make this thing, I'm not going to burn it up. I'm going a little bit faster. So going from four and a quarter outside diameter to five and a half, okay? So I'm bumping my RPM up from 900 to 1100. I think that's a smart way to go. And I'm getting the taper lock. I will never have to use the cutting torch to heat up anything to get that off, okay? It comes with some bolts in there, they're just quarter inch bolts. You draw it in with the quarter inch bolts and it's set. You, put, you move them to the threaded ones and you tighten all the bolts and it has a jacking effect and it uh, removes the taper lock. So that's my pulley saga. And I, I didn't, if you pair pulleys, you're going to be fine because you're buying two and the spacing will match and whatever. But I'm trying to match, not that pulley necessarily, but the, the pulley that goes on the headstock with the brake drum and the whole schmear, you know. Okay, wanted to get that out of the way. Um, I'm going to replace... <laughs> this O-ring is hard as a rock too. So I'm going to drive that seal out. You know, for, these are just old spacers. And get that seal out of there. Get a new seal. Get a new O-ring. Put it all back together. Got my new pulley. This son of a gun cost me $22 to send back. But, uh, you know, lesson learned. Uh, you know, being an engineer, I should know about pulleys and belts. Like I said, there's there's L belts, there's V belts, there's A belts, there's B belts, and there's more that I can't even remember. But that's that's what I chose to do. So no problem. Um, yeah. So I got it from uh, I think B and B, G and G. B and B manufacturing. They got a website. Good pulleys, good prices, cast iron. Uh, yeah, B and B manufacturing. You know, no affiliation. Shouting out. Excellent. All right, we're down here on the floor. I wanted to show you quick. This cast object here is the boring bar adapter for the boring and facing head that I bought for the uh, Giddings and Lewis horizontal boring mill. Two inch diameter bar is what it takes, okay? And I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in process of cleaning it up and putting it together, but that's the boring bar adapter. See the four bolts, flange mount? Um, so that's the boring bar adapter for the summit head. Now, That's the summit head. It's like 21 inch diameter. Fits on the Giddings and Lewis horizontal boring mill with an adapter 
of course. And that's the sliding part of the head. So that's where the boring bar adapter casting goes, which is, like I said, that piece right there. Now the fact that that's two inch and it'll take a two inch boring bar brings me to this. All right, so this, this is a cool piece. This is two inch diameter. This is from a Warner and Swayze um, turret lathe. Let me get it. And it's got a hunk of chunk of half inch, oh no, one inch diameter, one inch diameter, one inch slot, okay, for tooling. So that'll take up to a one inch bit. In reality, it's for half inch because this is all on center line, okay? So if you put a half inch lathe type tool bit in there, it's on center, okay? So that's kind of neat. It's got set screws from the bottom, set screws from the top. You can use set screws to angle it, lock it in. So this is set up for half inch tool bits, okay? And it's like I said, it says right on it, Warner Swayze, somewhere. So that's from a Warner and Swayze turret lathe. Now, I bought this um, at a very reasonable price from an eBay seller. I've been buying stuff from him um, a little bit here and there. Uh, his name is Jason. Uh, I'm going to try and pronounce the last name. Uh, I think it's Machowski. Jason Machowski. And his eBay store is uh, JM, I guess it stands for Jason Machowski, JM Industrial Surplus, I think is the name. But anyways, he's up there in Buffalo, New York, um, actually Hamburg or Boston, uh, but uh, right outside of Buffalo. And he goes to all kinds of crazy auctions. Um, interesting, I, I believe he's in the healthcare industry, but he, uh, he loves machine tools. Jason has a killer, very small clausing um, lathe. Uh, not the Colchester, England lathe, but the clausing, uh, I don't know what it is, 5190 something. It, it's the, I think the variable, sh uh, hydraulic variable speed with the reuse drive one. Um, but he's got a lot of cool stuff. So JM Industrial surplus on eBay. I figured I'd give him a shout out because he's a real good guy. Um, he also, uh, let me show you, on the Brown and Sharp 13, the headstock, right, uh, the work head. Uh, I purchased a spare one from Jason and uh, I'm going to retrofit it with a 5C Harding lathe spindle with the four degree taper and the 5C collets. So this, this whole spindle uh, work head, uh, I bought one of those off uh, uh, from Jason. And super guy, I thought I'd give him a shout out. I figure this, it, it, I believe it's 12 inches long, but this is gonna be a, a killer boring bar for the, uh, the work, um, the facing head, boring head. It, for, so that's a summit head, and I'm going to adapt it, like I said, to the, uh, the Giddings and Lewis with those bolts on there. So, uh, yep, yeah, that's, that's about that. Um, what else am I doing? On the floor, I've got some sheet metal for the uh, Colchester lathe. I'm thinking I might just strip the paint completely off that and respray it. That's like uh, where the belt guard goes, so you can't get your fingers in the pulleys and the belts. That's a switch bracket for the on-off forward reverse switch. So that's what I've been working on for now. Um, let me show you more in a little bit. All right, a little micro update from Doozer Shop. I got the pulley from the headstock cleaning in the uh, parts washer sink, and that's the brake hub and I got the seal out. Uh, I'm going to find a seal for it. Um, kind of interesting. You might notice 
somebody has broached another keyway and you can see damage where my fingers pointing at the bottom so sometime this thing got tweaked a little bit and then someone abandoned this keyway and they broached that one so that's kind of neat um, let's see this plate actually it goes this is for the electrical panel um, and it houses the uh, this is the main switch contactor um, for the lathe so in the panel is the switch contactor but also there's the uh, reversing switch so the way this mounts you can see it's in the shape of a panel the two slots are for the reversing switch and it mounts to the headstock with those two quarter inch holes so two bolts hold this thing to the lathe headstock um, and I know it works but it's just two bolts and I know it's on a flat plane and it's got all kinds of shear load and whatever it's fine but it just seems like a lot of stuff to hang on there if there's any vibration so let me take you around back and let me show you what's going on um, what I decided to do is add another two bolts so these two are original and these two I added okay so the spacing is three inches in between these and of course I made it the same three inches and I spaced it up inch and three-eighths and how I did that is this this is just a scrap it's actually a pipe manifold of some sort from an air compressor so I got four bolts in there the bottom two I bolted to the headstock and then the top bolt uh, the top holes are sized for a 201 tap drill I think I used 196 for a little bit more thread so that piloted my drill bit holes for those so that's how you, you do a little alignment jig for transferring bolt locations now these are blind holes these are four hundred thousandths deep this does not break into the oil of the headstock um, and they're, they're tapped with a bottoming tap and I decided to use studs because they are so shallow um, you know seemed like a good idea and maybe I'll put some blue Loctite on these guys um, I've got the handle this is the brake lever and this this is for the uh, the forward, forward reverse switch so the brake lever forward reverse switch and I've got some of that paraphernalia on um, so this goes to a start stop switch this is a clevis for the brakes there's a spring loaded deal because there's like a little detent pawl in here so there's a spring a washer uh, an e-clip and then this adapter this thing is the center um, smaller handle and that attaches to the forward reverse high low switch so just thought I'd show you that real quick oh and uh, let's see there's my hex nipple British pipe thread to uh, 3 8 and then my ball valve and I just threw an American pipe thread plug in it I don't like that big bulbous plug I want to get like a flush maybe Allen head plug but anyways so that's what I've been working on uh, let me show you more oh yeah now this is the bracket for the forward reverse high low switch I cleaned it all stripped it painted it and uh, gave it a coat of black paint so I've been, I did that as well 
All right, I've been cleaning the gunge. This is the input shaft. We cleaned the gunge around there and cleaning everything up, getting ready for when I put it back together. And you remember I said there's two wood roof keys lined up, and uh, let's see you know, if you can see that. You try and you can see there's a little damage on the right hand one. That's where the pulley was goobered up. I want to try and take a ball peen hammer and massage some of that back in there. But I'll show you also what I did. Um, the old keys are on the right, the new keys are on the left. And you can see here, let me kind of zoom in. Um, I've been selectively surface grinding them to fit. Now the difference is, these are taller, they're, they're higher. That was the problem. Um, well, you can see how much deeper they seat than, like, say, the old ones. Um, it's just, uh, I don't know why, but for, that's the reason I made the new ones, because, like I say, the, the, uh, there's a good shot. The old ones are not, they're barely in the pulley. So, I decided to make proper deeper ones and I decided to make them just maybe a thousandth wider so they're a nice snug fit and the uh, the one for the the wallered out key slot is a bit wider on the bottom but I ground the top you can see the the, the stripe there to, to, so that, that fits the pulley and the bottom fits tight in the shaft and this one here, it was fitting tight in the shaft on the left hand side, so I took a little surface grinder skim. It's a half thousandth off that edge. And they're uh, a light tap, tap in fit. So, um, so that's the old and the new. Trying to make this thing as strong as possible and just fix it properly. Um, I mean, this thing probably just suffered years of minimal maintenance in a factory so I'm trying to give it the love it deserves so those are the key uh, wood rough keys um, for the lathe alright guys just want to show you uh, I got to drill some more holes in that uh, that back plate that I added those holes in the lathe and I got it set up in the mill and a clamping solution um, there's a bracket Weld it on the back, and I was able to clamp it in the jaws of the vise. So that's all mounted tight in there. Um, so uh, I just got to come uh, inch and three eighths off of that, inch and three eighths off of that. Drill my through holes into. Uh, you can see there's a plate below, and then drill the access holes to put the nuts on in the top plate. So kind of a neat solution, uh, just clamped basically in the, uh, you can see that bracket that's welded to it, just clamped in the vise. I had to take the jaws off, but no big deal. But that's a, that's a good solution uh, for, uh, for drilling this uh, plate. So again, that's going to be uh, attached to the back of the lathe. And I got my four little studs in there. And uh, that's going to be a nice rigid mount. Not that it wasn't before, but just two bolts holding that whole big piece on, then an electrical box on there, and then an auxiliary um, contact switch, and then the actual main uh, drum switch. There's a lot of things. Like I said, the drum switch is going to connect onto there. Um, so, yeah, I feel better about having extra bolts in there, uh, studs, just as a little added insurance when things get you know, vibrating, you know, I, I just thought it was not too difficult to do, so that's what I did. And uh, just real quick here, uh, I got the, uh, the, the, the support panel uh, all painted up. Um, took me quite a while to clean it uh, around those welds and everything. Uh, you can see the two center holes are original and the two smaller holes are uh, uh, to the left are uh, 
the ones that I put in. But uh, I'm letting it dry. Actually, these welds are really good looking welds. Um, I think they're stainless steel, uh, stainless steel stick welds. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, you spend a lot of time paint, uh, scraping it down. Uh, actually, I was taking some of the uh, the slag from the weld still. They just never cleaned the slag off uh, back in the day, right? 1976. But, uh, yep, got it all detailed up. You know, preparation's 99% of the paint job. And uh, so I'm um, going cure overnight. And tomorrow I'll uh, fit it up. All right, one thing I noticed... Uh, this is the input bearing where the pulley goes on the headstock of the lathe and the posts for the brake shoes. So there's four countersunk, I'm sorry, counterboard, uh, four counterboard holes for the Allen screws that were uh, attaching it. And uh, you see these, what I did, as you can see, I, the head. I turned all the diameters five thousandths for head clearance because these were just like scraping the knurling um, when I unscrewed them, and you can see the black oxide in the you know the part where the, it cleaned up on the lathe and where it didn't. Um, I gripped these in a five C collet and spun them on the Sagami lathe. You can still see some ridges, and sometimes you can just barely not. So, I'm going to stick this in here. I'm going to stick it upside down. Um, you know, that's how they go, you know. Um, and you could just tell, taking them out, they were just rubbing. So this whole bunch of them, put them over in the Sagami lathe, and I gripped on the threads on the shank with a 5C collet. I know I got the chuck in there now. I was doing something else. But, uh... Yeah, I was gripping on the shanks, and I just, uh, this half inch diameter, I took five thou off each one, so two and a half thou, you know, radially, um, just because, you know, th this guy here, it was just too tight coming off, and it's actually located, I can't even show you, there's an O-ring groove in there, so it's actually tight in the bore, so they're not sized the bolts, uh, the screws are not size tight for location. I got, you know, an O-ring. It's a three and three eighths outside diameter O-ring. So I got to get a new one of those because it just lost all its tension and might have been all right, but might have been leaking oil. It's still got the flange to seal it, but I figure if I'm ordering an oil seal, um, the oil seal is hard as a rock. I just I destroyed the rubber a little getting it out. What I did is I took a washer, I inserted it through, and I uh, was partially uh, had the washer underneath the the back of the seal, and it gave me something to drive against with a hammer and a, a driving pin. So um, kind of a weird seal. The shaft is inch and three quarter. The outside diameter is two and three eighths and it's a half inch wide but I did find one um, it's not a, a national seal it's a, it's a different brand or something I maybe it's a European size but either way just wanted to give you a you know a, a quick view uh, of some of the little things I have to do to make this lathe right and that was turn the heads of those bolts uh, screws rather five thousandths so they fit where they're supposed to fit with uh, no fuss and muss um, when it goes back together until uh, you know we have to reassemble it so uh, yeah that's that all right quick update um, I got the brake lever on and I got the uh, the switch on so this is uh, off forward low speed forward high speed, low, off, and then reverse, low, and reverse high. And of course this is the brake. 
And um, how it's attached is what I've been working on. Alright, so that's the plate on the back of the lathe. It's still going to get uh, the box for the, uh, the contact relay. So the two big holes were the original holes and then the two little bit smaller holes were the the ones I drilled and tapped into the headstock for additional support. Uh, I got quarter 20 uh, studs, actually long set screws in there and nuts because it's always good uh, to do the studs thing. Um, here's that bracket um, which is attached the uh, drum switch. You kind of So there's the drum switch in the bracket. I gotta hook up the wires yet. Um, there's the attachment fittings and there's the brake lever and, and the switch goes in there for the uh, when you hit the brake it kills the motor also. Drops out the main contactor. So I thought this was good progress for uh, yeah there she goes so now I gotta get the wires and the conduit all figured out I got a piece of conduit I changed the the flexible conduit um, and uh, it's a little bit nicer than the old stuff so uh, yeah we'll figure it out and uh, we'll get this wired up alright one more quick note um, this is where the uh, the holes where the conduit hooks in and you might be able to see the uh, as it was a, it was a knockout uh, ring for you know universal sizing and uh, they always break out I, I hate that because then you're left with loose just chaos so I know the size obviously I need it so I just TIG welded it in in a uh, whole bunch of spots on the perimeter so that's going to be solid and if you notice the metal is double thick um, and I added reinforcement because this whole back piece was kind of bent up and you might be able to see um, I added another piece of metal in there so it's, it's double thick and uh, screws there uh, attach it so I wanted this to be nice and strong um, with the conduit because the conduit I mean is flexible but it's still hefty not super bendy stuff um, so yeah just wanted to show you the the modification and the strengthening I did just to try and make this lathe a little bit nicer a little bit better Alright guys, back to lathe. Uh, I just wanted to show you um, something and talk about something. So you remember on my previous video series I've been hot and heavy with this uh, re-engineering this power feed setup on the Colchester 17. Um, and it's kind of like a rocker box, almost like a, a Norton quick change box. Um, so that's disengaged and you move it, that's cross feed, move it over, and of course that's uh, uh, facing feed. But I saw this YouTube video and the guy was restoring a Holbrook 13 lathe. Now Pardon my ignorance, I don't, I don't know if that's a British lathe or a German lathe. I kind of thought it was German. Um, but I noticed the power feed on this Holbrook 13. It had a rocker box very, and a worm gear and a spur gear next to the worm gear 
in the, the feed rod that ran through the, the spur gear. And it had the same, you know, rocker system that went up and down and latched in and, and, and whatever. But what amazed me, I say amazed, but it's only because I'm seeking the information. It had two of them, okay? It had two separate um, rocker boxes. So it had one, one for cross feed, and it had a separate independent one for the bad feed. And I'm like, okay, thinking, um, pieces of the puzzle are coming together. So I think Colchester did this as an economy measure um, to save money on, on their lathes. Because this Holbrook, it was almost identical. Um, except it had two separate, identical, individual uh, rocker boxes. So there's no sliding for and aft, you just up, down, and then up, down. And because of that, of course, um, you know, it's very well supported. You know, the sides of this rocker box affair, you know, are supported by bearings. The axial thrust is uh, absorbed. That's why I had to make that whole uh, tab and, you know, notched in uh, retaining thing underneath because the whole rocker box because it's free to move when it you know was re, re, in the one position or the other position um, the only thing keeping it from moving fore and aft was this handle how it locks into the front and the back would uh, torque left and right but in the whole brook design because there's two, two handles and two rocker boxes, um, you know, they're all locked in. Now, if you remember, this one um, in the, the cross feed is locked in on this side because the apron wall is over here. And when it's in the other uh, bed feed, it's locked in on that side because the apron wall is there. But in the middle is where it was causing the lack of support, and it would... Uh, torque and bind up on the bushing. So, another way to say what I just said, if I had access to spare parts, like a parts lathe, and I stole another rocker box and another handle and another set of gears, I could put another all those parts on this side, and I'd have two handles. I have one for the bed feed and one for the cross feed, and I wouldn't have had to make that affair where it it, uh, it locks into that tab and slot and supports the, uh, the outboard edge. Because that's how the Holbrook 13 is built. It's got two of these. And like I said, if I had a parts lathe and I had access to another rocker box and handle and gears, I could put it together. That would be sweet. That'd be so sweet. But, so, anyhow, like I said, I got excited when I seen this gentleman's video of his Holbrook 13 lathe he was putting together. I guess I'm becoming a little bit of a student in lathe design. <laughs> old lathe design. Um, when I make the video of my handy lathe apron, um, we'll go over, compare and contrast the differences. And, th and the handy's got, uh, 
It's a little different. I think it, the Hemi has two worms, but I think the worms are directly on the uh, feed rod. They don't have uh, transposing uh, spur gears. And they have clutches. The Hemi has clutches. So it's a little bit different, but it's got two of them. But anyways, that's all. I just wanted to share my thoughts. And like I said, just to sum it up, I could have fixed this if I had another handle and another rocker box and another set of gears. I could have one here and one there. There would be no sliding back and forth involved. It would be pretty sweet. You know, when you work on these pieces of equipment, you really get to see inside the head of the engineers that designed them. I guess that's why I like it. You know, I'm an engineer, and I like, uh, I like to think about mechanical things. That's why I am an engineer. I love to think about mechanical things. I've been thinking about mechanical things long before I went to college for a degree. You know, I... I mean, I'm, that's, the degree is, is just to get you in the door for a job, but I learned what I learned from just working on stuff and fixing stuff, and then um, what, what really brought it home was when I was introduced in, to the, the math of the, uh, like, force vectors, a, a, a force with a direction, a magnitude in a direction. Uh, that was a really cool thing to, uh, to put my ideas, uh, you know, on paper to be able to talk and describe. See, but before I even knew what a force vector was, I had in my mind uh, the concept of a force vector, a force in a direction, and if you're pushing from not a straight, straight on and you're off at an angle, how much force goes straight on and how much goes you know, 90 degrees or whatever. I kind of had that concept in my head back when I was like 14, 15 years old messing around with go-karts and clutch linkages and trying to make an offset linkage and, and trying to figure out how to make the bracketry and the bell cranks and you know the pedal throw and anyways. But anyways, yeah, just wanted to share with you about the, the, the similar design of the Holbrook 13 lathe. Fascinating. The journey continues. Alright guys, uh, this right here, does anybody know what it is? I'll give you a hint, Kearney Trekker. <clears throat> so somebody at work ran the Kearney and Trekker out of oil completely and seized up the spindle, the gears, the whatever. And they're scrapping it out. So I saved this from it. Now what this is, it's got louvers on it. It's got these fancy little uh, balls and slots, kind of Art Deco. It was originally painted like a, a green 2H plane. And what it is, it's a breather. Okay, so this is a labyrinth. There's a plate welded, um, spun, it, there's, those are like, they're little like tits that stick out of the casting and they're spun down like a rivet. So, there's a plate in there with a gap at the top, and there's a plate uh, on the back with a gap at the bottom. So this air can go in, up, over that plate, come down, and around the back of this plate. So it's kind of cool. It's aluminum, cast aluminum. Uh, I'm assuming uh, definitely a die casting. Um, I saved a couple handles off it. Uh, I think I sent a handle to a guy on Practical Machinist. Uh, I just sent it to him for free, basically cover my shipping. Um, but this is cool. 
Um, I was going to hang it on the wall, but I got to thinking, can I use this as a breather anywhere? And then I got to thinking, um, the Rockford Planer, uh, I, I'm not really sure how it breathes. Um, I'm just not sure, but um, this has these round covers uh, in the oil reservoir, and I got the center off this cover, I guess they're manhole covers, and you can see, um, there's two Allen screws holding it on, on the cover, same here, right, so I took this one off, uh, I guess it's a handhole in the manhole, but, uh, kind of show you, that fits in there, and I'd have to cover up the, the bolt holes, they're quarter twenty, but I could put, I could get a plate, like an adapter plate, and make it out of like a quarter inch steel or aluminum, and adapt it And that'd be the breather, and, and there's, there's, there's oil in there. It's down about two inches, you know, it's like yay right there. So I'm gonna pump the oil out, um, do an oil change, it's 30 gallons of oil. But how cool would this breather vent from a Kearney and Tracker horizontal mill look and repurposed on the Rockford planer? Now, like I said, I don't know. Oh, I know how it breathes. That's the drain back hole under that screen at the end of the table. That's how it breathes. So, that's how the sump, the reservoir, uh, breathes air. Because when, when hydraulic fluid is being pumped out, it's got to be replenished. Uh, the level has to, it's, it's, air has to get in. So I guess it would be superfluous and unnecessary to put it on there. But sure would be cool, wouldn't it? To have this part live on as an actual breather. And that's open, I guess, to catch any oil. But... Uh, well, I guess I answered my own question. Maybe I'll hang it on the wall. Because it looks cool. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I think hanging it on the wall would be good. I got get some, like, a couple of inch and a half drywall screws. Put on the wall. Um, so you might remember, this is from a U.S. Burke multi-miller. I think I'll move the stupid cardboard beer cutout and put that there. Yeah, that'd be cool. All right, just another musing from Doozer Shop. All right, real quick for you. Uh, here is the, uh, the clutch handle from that Kearney and Trekker. Um, this is the same machine that I got that uh, the vent from. Um, it's kind of neat. Uh, any Kearney Trekker owners will recognize it for sure. Um, it's got the uh, electrical box built in with start and stop buttons uh, for the motor. And it had the uh, the shaft that hooked to the clutch was hollow and had the, the wires inside of course. You know. But uh, Kind of a neat piece. Uh, I couldn't see it go off to the scrap man. A lot of years of polish on that ball. Uh, you know, uh, just a really cool piece. You got access in the tops of Fisher wires, that little cover. Um, but it's got a single uh, duplex electrical uh, box built into it. Uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Kearney and Trekker machines, uh, this this is kind of a cool piece. Uh, most owners will recognize this instantly. So, uh, you know, maybe I can incorporate it into something, you know, in the shop. 
Um, that would be kind of neat to repurpose it. I mean, it's all kinds of levers on the, uh, well, on the horizontal boring mill. Uh, maybe I can figure out, you know, uh, another lever or maybe. So, uh, is it this one? No, this is the main, that's the main clutch for forward and reverse. Maybe I can extend that out down further or something. I, I don't know. But anyways, thought it was kind of cool uh, to show you that. Um, yep, Kearney and Trekker uh, clutch handle. Another quick eBay a quick eBay uh, purchase. Um, got this Federal vertical style um, indicator, dial test indicator and uh, came from Eastman Kodak in Rochester the gen I can't make out the date I just can't for the life of me figure out what that says but uh, gentleman uh, was a retired tool maker so the eBay ad said and look how thick that crystal is and it is very clear. It's in fine condition. Um, it's got this uh, gooseneck indicator that goes on the dovetail. And uh, yeah, it's 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 a good find. Um, I paid. I think I bid eighteen dollars for this, and I got it. I think shipping was another five, six, seven, eight bucks, but uh, the Federals, they got, there's like a little hole in the tip there. You could thread a piece of fishing line in in through there, I, I, uh, I guess. I don't know what that's for. It's a short tip. I guess that doesn't hurt anything. But uh, that's the only thing I see that's kind of weird. It's a short. I, I got another Federal with a short stylus, I guess you'd call it tip stylus. But uh, anyways, got a gooseneck on it. All for eighteen dollars and uh, whatever shipping there. I think it was uh, yeah, eight dollars shipping. But that's cool. Uh, just another cool little item there. I uh, wanted to show you here and uh, do the shop.